All right, we're going to open up to the book of Acts, chapter 13. And this is a, a relatively long chapter. It's actually one of the longer chapters in the book of Acts. It's 52 verses. And so I, I'm probably only going to get through about the first 12 or so verses here. I don't want to rush through uh, this chapter. There's a lot here. And so we'll, we'll break this uh, chapter up into a couple of teachings here tonight and next Wednesday night for sure we'll be in Acts 13, maybe for three Wednesdays, uh, just to see um, how far we, we, we get here uh, tonight. But I, again, I'm not, I'm not attempting to really go too far into this chapter here, uh, so we're just going to slow down and we're going to take our time and, and we, we look at uh, this transition point, really a turning point in the book of Acts where we are no longer going to be following uh, Peter. Uh, we are now going to be following Paul the Apostle. The first 12 chapters of the book of Acts uh, primarily uh, were focused on Peter and the ministry of Peter. And Peter's ministry was primarily to the circumcision or to the Jews and the Jewish converts. Uh, now that overwhelmingly uh, Judaism has rejected Christianity and rejected the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is uh, sometime in the, in, in the uh, time frame of uh, 46 to uh, 44 to 46 AD, something like that. So the church is probably 12 to 14 years old here at this point. And at this point, uh, the, the focal point becomes the message of the gospel to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. And, you know, the, the, the scripture said that the, the gospel would go to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. And uh, we're told in John chapter 1, Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. And so overwhelmingly, the nation of Israel rejected Jesus Christ in the early days of the church, and all the way to this day, overwhelmingly, uh, the nation of Israel and, and those who practice Judaism reject Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They're blinded, uh, according to the book of Romans, to, to the fact that Jesus is their Messiah, because they rejected him. God has hardened their hearts and blinded their eyes to some degree. There is a great outpouring uh, of the Holy Spirit now in the last days where there's more Jews being converted uh, to Christianity at this time than any other time in history except for the very early days of the church and that's exciting and that's also uh, uh, prophetically significant uh, because Jesus Christ uh, is going to return uh, to save the nation of Israel and then, and then they will look upon him whom they pierced and they will mourn for him uh, as one mourns for an only, uh, an only son. And, and according to the book of Romans in chapter 11, at that time when Jesus Christ returns, all of Israel uh, who survived the tribulation period, the one third or so of the Jews who survived the tribulation period, all of Israel uh, will be saved at that time. But now we are going to pivot from the focal point being Peter in ministering to, uh, to, to the Jews and, and, the, and, and the focus being on the Jewish Christians to St. Paul and the uh, ministry to the Roman world and, and, and the Gentile church throughout the Roman Empire. In Galatians chapter 2, uh, Paul, who wrote the book of Galatians, as a matter of fact, we're going to see that he's going into the area uh, of, of Galatia here today in Acts chapter 13 and uh, this region of Galatia, he's going to write a, a letter to the churches that are there, and it's the letter to the Galatians. And Paul the Apostle tells us this about uh, his calling to the Gentiles and Peter's calling to the circumcision or to the Jews in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 7. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, Paul says, the uncircumcised would be the Gentiles, as the gospel for the circumcision was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. Uh, and then he goes, and when James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles, and they to the circumcised. And so the circumcised would be the Jews. And so he, he's clearly telling us, uh, even as when uh, Paul was initially uh, saved and God called him, God said, go for he is a chosen vessel of mine in Acts chapter 9 verse 15 uh, to bear my name before the Gentiles. And so primarily Paul, who was an expert in the law of Judaism, uh, surprisingly to us maybe, became the apostle to the Gentiles. And 
It has been said even by secular uh, theologians and secular historians that if there was no Paul the Apostle, you would not have had Christianity uh, uh, reach the Roman world as, as it did so quickly. I mean, Paul literally took the gospel over the entire uh, Roman Empire in just a, a few decades in his short lifetime before uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, incarcerated and he was later beheaded by, by Emperor Nero. Um, Jesus didn't travel more than 100 miles from the place of his birth in his entire lifetime, where Paul traveled many thousands, tens of thousands of miles in his lifetime, uh, taking the, the gospel to the, to the known world. And so it is a significant turning point here uh, in the book of Acts and in the history of the church. Again, this is sometime around 44 to 46 A.D. So we read in Acts chapter 13 and verse 1, now, in the church that was at, at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, interesting, we're going to see Saul's name here uh, in this chapter actually changed to Paul. Uh, in, in verse 13, we see him called Paul, and from that point on, uh, Acts 13, 13, his name is now Paul. It's changed from Saul, as Jesus changed so many people's names. Uh, Peter's name was Cephas before it was changed to, uh, to Peter. John Mark was called John, whose surname or nickname was Mark. Uh, Barnabas' name was changed from uh, what his name was before. And so in, in, the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, we see many, many uh, of the... Uh, apostles and, and of the early church leaders that God changed their name when they had an encounter with God. Uh, they, they took on a new name, and that is true certainly for, for Saul, who is, is going to be called Paul here shortly. But this is the church in Antioch. Antioch was the headquarters of the church in the Gentile region of Syria. It's interesting that we're hearing all about Syria and Turkey uh, in the media today, and you're seeing maps of, of Syria and Turkey because of the uh, earthquakes that they are suffering uh, there currently, um, but this is this is the area where where the church was focused. This was the central headquarters of the early church at this point outside of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was the headquarters of the church for the first ten or twelve years, and everything kind of went out from Jerusalem. From this point on, uh, the headquarters moves some two hundred and twenty-five or two hundred and fifty miles north into the area of modern-day Syria. Even then, it was Syria in Bible times. Uh, there, toward the Mediterranean Sea, in the city of Antioch, and it is interesting that Antioch is. Uh, geographically very close to Tarsus, uh, which is where Paul was from, and Tarsus is in modern-day Turkey, and that's where uh, Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle, uh, was born and where, where he was raised. He did train under Gamaliel in Jerusalem as a young man. That's where he learned the law, and he learned uh, the Old Testament and became a leader and a Pharisee uh, of the Jews. But uh, Paul, we'll call him Paul from this point, uh, Paul had a good understanding of Gentile culture. He had a good understanding, uh, really a mastery of the Greek language. He knew the culture. He knew the language. He knew the Roman customs. He was a Roman citizen, and he was uh, Jewish through and through. He was, he was uh, a, a Jew of the Jews, he, he goes on to say, of the tribe of Benjamin, uh, like King Saul, the first king of Israel, was of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day and all the rest. So Paul was perfect to be that apostle to the Gentiles. We're told here that they were in Antioch, there in uh, the eastern part of Syria, toward the Mediterranean Sea. And there in the church in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Now the prophets were the ones who would primarily uh, speak forth the word of God. They would proclaim the word of God, and the word of God is prophetic, as you know. If you sit under the teaching of the word of God, God will speak to you through his word. It is a gift of prophecy. I'm not a prophet, but I can almost guarantee you, if you come in with ears to hear, God will speak to you every single time that you hear a Bible teacher open the word of God 
and share the word with you because it is the forth telling uh, of the word of God, speaking forth the word of God that becomes prophetic when God speaks to you through his word. Now there were in the early church days, there were also uh, those who had the office of the prophet. And we read in Ephesians uh, chapter 4 in verse 11, he himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so it was one of the five offices in the early church that God did distribute, Jesus distributed, distributed to the early church leaders uh, with these power gifts and these, and these offices so that they could build uh, the church, the foundation of the church. In verse 7 of Ephesians 4, we're told that uh, each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so these are giftings and callings and offices of God. You remember that uh, in the book of Acts, when uh, Peter was talking about the Holy Spirit being poured out, and they thought that the men were drunk with wine because they were speaking with other tongues. And then Peter says, no, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, says the Lord, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall see visions, uh, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And so the prophetic gift was very active in the early church, uh, as I believe the prophetic gift is active today. Now, I don't believe that we have the same offices of the prophet uh, or the apostle uh, as they did in the early church. I just don't think that we have prophets that walk around that everything that they say, thus saith the Lord, uh, is necessarily of God. Because oftentimes these prophets or these apostles in the hyper-Pentecostal churches, um, they'll prophesy things that don't come to pass. So then you know this is not a prophecy of God. I remember when uh, I was in Santa Maria when I was working there and I was studying to be a pastor teaching a youth group at Calvary Chapel of Guadalupe, and I was working as a stockbroker. We had a, a, a very, very hyper-Pentecostal church that was there in the city of Santa Maria, and they had a prophet that was there who was predicting a massive earthquake. He was predicting, a and he was literally saying, and it was a big church, thousands of people, and it, I heard the recording. He was saying, on this date, mark your calendars, thus saith the Lord, the Lord has shown me, and he was a traveling prophet within his Pentecostal denomination and um, of course the date came and went and, and and the prophecy didn't come true and the earthquake never happened and then he just went on to make more false prophecies after that nobody called him on the other false thank thank God nobody really believed him and sold their houses and moved out of California and took took it seriously uh, but he claimed to be a prophet of God he also uh, prophesied that a woman who had died in the church was going to be resurrected uh, this is when they finally called him out as a wolf in sheep's clothing and a false prophet because uh, this family believed so strongly that this prophet had said when your mother dies, your grandmother dies, God is going to do this great sign and wonder and he's going to raise your loved one from the dead. And so he would not allow them uh, to embalm her. He would not allow them to take her body out of the church. Her body laid there in the church uh, you know, for, for, for three days, and he prophesied, like with Lazarus, that on the fourth day she was going to be resurrected. And of course, the third and the fourth and the fifth day came and went, and the poor lady was still dead. And they had to take her and, you know, uh, uh, you know embarrassingly call the funeral home and have them come and take her body after three or four days to embalm her. Uh, and a lot of people actually left that church and they rejected their faith in Jesus Christ as, as a result of the false prophecies because the church had put so much emphasis on signs and wonders, prophecies and miracles. And so I don't believe we have prophets today uh, as we did in Bible times, but I do believe that the gift of prophecy is still very, very active in the body of Christ, that the Lord still can speak prophetically, he can foretell, tell the future, and he could foretell, he could tell you uh, the word of God, the spirit speaking through uh, uh, men and, and women who God chooses to use. But I don't, I don't believe we have uh, prophets in the church as they did uh, in, in the book of Acts, not in the same way. 
But they did have prophets, and they needed the prophets at this time. Uh, and oftentimes in the book of Acts, the prophet would have a word from the Lord uh, that would be very clearly uh, uh, directing the church's uh, path in the early church and the direction and the decisions that the early church leaders would make, especially like where they're going to go and where they're not going to go uh, and so forth. So we have again, Barnabas and Saul, we're told in chapter, 20, uh, chapter 12, verse 25, returned from Jerusalem. They had fulfilled their ministry. They took with them John, whose surname was Mark. They're coming from Jerusalem back to the church in Antioch. In the church in Antioch, chapter 13, verse 1, there's certain prophets and teachers. These would be Bible teachers teaching the word of God. You have Barnabas. Now, we've already been introduced from, to Barnabas uh, early in the book of Acts. Barnabas was a Jewish convert to Christianity from the island of Cyprus. Uh, Barnabas was a traveling companion of Saul until they had a falling out over um, Barnabas' cousin, John Mark, who we're going to read about here tonight. Uh, they delivered, you remember, Barnabas and Saul delivered a financial gift uh, from the area of Antioch down to the saints in Jerusalem. Uh, we read about that back in Acts chapter 11 in verse 29. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. That's the area of Jerusalem. This they did also and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So uh, Barnabas was a leader in the early church even prior to Saul being converted. And Barnabas and Saul were a very powerful uh, duo traveling around and, and doing the work of the Lord uh, in the early church. So you have uh, Barnabas, you have um, John Mark. Now John Mark uh, is the author of the gospel of Mark. We're told in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10 that he was a cousin of Barnabas, so he was directly related uh, to Barnabas. We're also told that he was very close to Peter. Some believe that he was actually um, friends with Peter's household, and they went way back to when, when uh, John Mark was just a, a child, that he was raised around Peter and Peter's family. Uh, we read in the book of First Peter and chapter 5, Peter references him in verse 13, where he says, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark my son. And this is John Mark. This is the John Mark who we're reading about in, in Acts chapter 13, at the end of Acts 12 as well. Uh, he's also the John Mark who wrote the gospel book of, of Mark. And some believe that John Mark was the unidentified young male who was there uh, at the Garden of Gethsemane that's only recorded in the Gospel of Mark. If you look at the Gethsemane accounts in Mark's Gospel, it's only there that you find that there's a young unnamed man who is hiding and the guards see him and catch him and take his cloak and he runs away naked. And we're not told any, anywhere else who this is, but uh, church historians believe that that was actually John Mark, that he was there as a 12 or 13 year old boy watching Jesus when he was there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, he was very close to Peter. He traveled, uh, uh, as we're going to see here, with, with Paul and Barnabas and later uh, traveled with Barnabas. Um, Paul uh, says that he was um, helpful to him later in his life in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and, and verse 11. Paul says, get Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me in the ministry. So John Mark was a young man and, and he was probably uh, here at this point in Acts 13, probably in his early 20s. And he uh, didn't necessarily start out great, as we're going to see. He kind of bailed on, um, on, on Paul and, and Barnabas on their missionary trip. And Paul wasn't real happy with him. But, but later on, uh, John Mark was, was reconciled to Paul, uh, did great work with Barnabas. And uh, most, most Bible scholars believe that he's the one uh, that, that wrote the, the gospel of Mark with Peter, that Peter actually sat with John Mark and dictated to him everything that happened and everything that Jesus did. And so uh, he is uh, another individual here that we are looking at tonight. You have um, Simon, who was called Niger, uh, Niger would be from the area of, of Nigeria, which would be West Africa. 
Uh, we don't really know who this, uh, uh, Simeon, who, who's called Niger. Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene was another African nation. Uh, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and literally brought up with is in the household of. And so you have, um, you just have all these different people. You have Barnabas, who was, who was from the Greek Isle uh, of Cyprus. You have these two African men who were there uh, among this group. You have this other man who was uh, raised in, in the family of Herod Antipas, the household of Herod Antipas, who was the son of Herod the Great. Uh, Herod Antipas was the one who had John uh, the Baptist beheaded. And so this is someone from his household. And uh, so you, you just see the, the different group that God has brought together here in the early church in this missionary um, uh, event. And Saul, of course. And Saul is uh, Paul the Apostle, Saul of Tarsus, who was saved on the road to Damascus. Verse 2 of Acts 13. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. And the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So they're gathering together in the headquarters of the Gentile church in the city of Antioch. The prophets are there. The teachers are there. You have these leaders of the church that are there. They're ministering to the Lord. And, you know, ministering to the Lord is just serving the Lord. Minister means servant. And so if you are a minister, you are a servant and jesus said the greatest among you is the greatest servant jesus said the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many jesus took the place of a servant and he washed his disciples feet to model service in in servanthood and servant leadership to them and so this is what we see uh, taking place in the early church. They're servants. They're ministering to the Lord. And the way that you minister to the Lord is you minister to the people. The way you serve God is you serve God's people. Jesus told Peter, uh, if you love me, Peter, feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Take care of my lambs. And that's how we serve the Lord, practically speaking, is by serving uh, God's people, the sheep and, and, and the lambs of God. It says they were serving the Lord and they were fasting. And so fasting is something that was uh, prevalent in the early church. Fasting is merely the denial of the flesh. Obviously, the um, most obvious way to fast is to not eat food. Uh, but you could fast other things as well. You could fast television. You could fast music, secular music. Or you could fast, mo fast movies or, uh, you know, social media or candy or sugar or coffee or you pick it i mean there's anything that you could fast that your flesh says i really really want this you know and it may not even be something that's necessarily bad or sinful but you want to deny the flesh just like food isn't bad or sinful but when you fast you deny your body that that um you know that that feeding of the flesh with food and so it is the idea of denying the flesh and focusing on the spirit and fasting was very common in the early church fasting was also uh, common in Judaism we see the fasting in the in the book of Esther uh, with the feast of Purim uh, when they were fasting uh, for, for 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 God to do a work there with uh, with Haman who was trying to kill all of the Jews and Esther who was going to be appealing to uh, to, to her husband Asher Harris Artaxerxes there in the Medo-Persian Empire, and they were all fasting. They're denying the flesh so that they could focus on the spirit and so that they could pray and fast. It's not just fasting for health reasons. It's praying and fasting or fasting and praying. Yom Kippur, uh, the National Day of Atonement for the Jews, uh, they also practiced fasting at that time. So it was something that was practiced uh, among Judaism, and then it was something that Jesus taught his disciples to do, actually. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think that we in the church today fast enough. I think most of us these days don't really fast at all. I mean, I, I used to fast a lot more when I was a younger Christian, a newer believer than I, than I do now. I'm ashamed to tell you that as your pastor. I should fast more uh, because I think fasting is a very good thing for us to be spiritually more attuned and, and to be spiritually uh, more fit, as it were, and, and you know, you're denying your, your flesh and you are feeding your spirit, and the Lord definitely honors that. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 16, Jesus taught us to fast. He said, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, 
for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, Jesus Christ is assuming that you are fasting, just so you know. Because he says, when you give, don't be like the hypocrites. So Jesus assumes that you're giving financially to his work. When you pray, don't be like the hip hypocrites. Jesus Christ assumes, if you're one of his, that you are praying. And then Jesus says, when you fast. So Jesus assumes that we're fasting. Um, and, and so I think that that's something that, that, that really should, you know, uh, encourage us and exhort us to practice fasting, even, even if it's just sometimes and, and, and not something that, that is done all the time or, 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 you know, every single week or something like that. But I think we should fast. He says, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So the presumption is that we should be those who fast. And when we fast, and if we fast, we shouldn't be doing it to be seen, to be spiritual by men, to where we tell everybody we're fasting so that they think we're holy or they think that we're trying to be super spiritual or, you know, uh, be holier than thou. It's something really where you're fasting before God and, and, and the Lord will honor your fast. Fasting is also a, a part of spiritual warfare, according to Jesus in Matthew chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 17, we have the story of the boy who was... Um, an epileptic and he was he was demon possessed and the father had come to um, Jesus's disciples and asked them to cast the demon out and they were not able to so this man came to to Jesus and said Lord have mercy on my son Matthew 17 15 he's an epi epileptic he suffers severely he often falls into the fire and often into the water I brought him to your disciples but they could not cure him then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. So this child was demon, this young man was demon possessed, uh, no doubt had opened the door through witchcraft or some practice of sorcery to open the door to the demon to come in. And then uh, nobody could, could, could help this kid. He was, he was having seizures. He was, the demon was trying to kill him, throwing him into the fire, throwing him into the water, trying to drown him. And the father, in desperation, comes to Jesus, and, and Jesus casts this, this demon out. He rebukes him, and the demon came out of him, and the child was cured uh, from that hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out, cast out this devil? And Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, Matthew 17, 21, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, some uh, Bible translations don't have this verse in, in the Bible because it was in some of the later manuscripts, uh, this verse. But I, I think that there is something here that, that God is trying to tell us that there is a spiritual power in fasting when it comes to spiritual warfare and when it comes to breakthroughs in spiritual warfare, especially when you're dealing with demonic possession, demonic oppression, and so forth. And again, I think that uh, as we deny the flesh through fasting and we feed the spirit, then we, we become stronger uh, in the spirit when it comes to uh, battling the enemy in, in spiritual warfare uh, in possession cases and, and and so forth. So again, back in verse two of Acts chapter thirteen, they ministered to the Lord and they were fasting, and the Holy Spirit said, "Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them." So how did the Holy Spirit say this? No doubt through one of the prophets who were there. The prophet spoke prophetically and the Lord spoke through the gift of prophecy. We're already told that there were certain prophets and teachers there. So the Holy Spirit spoke to them clearly. This is the direction. Separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So they're called out. They're separated unto uh, this work uh, of the Lord set apart as uh, in the Greek aphorizo. And it literally means that you're, you're consecrated, you're set out, you're set apart 
uh, you're, you're separated unto a work of God. And we've been looking at being separated from the flesh on Sunday mornings in the last couple of messages so that we could be free to be separated unto the Lord and set apart unto the Lord. We have to be set apart from the works of the flesh and the lust of the flesh in order to be clean vessels so that the Lord could then use us uh, in a powerful way. The vessels of honor uh, that uh, Paul talks about in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2. So separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. They were called into this mission. They were called into this work. And, you know, the Bible tells us that the gifting and the calling of God are irrevocable. I believe we are all gifted with different gifts, and I believe we're all called to serve the Lord. In whatever capacity that is, it, it may be one thing for you, another thing for me, and another thing for someone else. We're many members of one body. Not all are an eye, not all are a nose, not all are a hand or a foot. We're all members of the body of Christ. We all have gifts and we all are called to serve the Lord in whatever capacity that looks like. And your job is to seek the Lord and maybe pray and fast and seek uh, the Lord's wisdom as to what your gifts are, if you don't know what your gifts are, or what God is calling you to. He may be calling you to serve as an usher. He may be calling you to serve in the children's ministry. He may be calling you to serve in the info center. Uh, he may be calling you to go down in town and feed the homeless uh, at, at the homeless shelter or the soup kitchen. Uh, he may be calling you to serve you know, in the community in some capacity, in evangelism or what have you. So we all are, are called to serve the Lord. You may be called to be a prayer warrior. Maybe your gifting is intercessory prayer, and that's such an important and needed gift uh, in <clears throat> the body of Christ. So they were set apart for the work to which God had called them. Verse 3, then having fasted and prayed, again, we see that repeated, they're fasting and they're praying, <clears throat> so they're denying the flesh and they're seeking the things of the Spirit. After uh, having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. <clears throat> now this laying on of hands <clears throat> is when you are ordaining into the ministry, when you are affirming a gifting or a calling uh, upon someone in front of the leadership and in front of the body, um, or, or when you are being commissioned by God onto a task. And it goes all the way back to the Old Testament when they would anoint the, the prophets, the priests, and the kings. They would often lay hands upon them in the Old Testament. They would anoint them with oil. The oil was symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And they would literally commission them by the laying on of hands and transferring, as it were, uh, the, 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 the power of the Holy Spirit to do that work and to uh, show uh, those who are watching that, that, you know, we are commissioning this one to do this work. So it's an affirmation. It's a confirmation. It's a commissioning. <clears throat> and it's a recognition that, that this one is called into this office or into this ministry. I remember when I was <clears throat> ordained by, by Pastor Chuck <clears throat> Smith at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. Um, <clears throat> he, he, you know, I asked him if he would ordain me and he and I would talk. Uh, I'd go visit him, you know, down on, on Sunday nights at times and visit with him after Sunday night church service in his office. And, um, and I'd ask him if he would ordain me. And he said, sure, you know, I'll ordain you. I, I was already a pastor, a Calvary Chapel pastor. I hadn't been officially ordained yet. I was up at Calvary Chapel of Tehachapi. And so he sent me a certificate <clears throat> in the mail. They mailed me a certificate uh, signed by Chuck Smith. I still have the certificate and I still have the little card that he signed that, you know, he was ordaining me on behalf of the board of Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa. And I emailed him and I said, Chuck, would it be possible for me to come down and have you lay hands on me like they did in the Bible, in the book of Acts, where they would lay hands on the people to ordain them, you know? And, uh, and he says, sure, you know, come on down. He told me when to come down on a Wednesday night. And um, when I got there, I talked to his staff and I didn't know how he was going to do it. Well, he ended up calling me up on stage in front of the whole church and I spoke from his pulpit and he called up all of his board members and all of his elders and all of his pastors um, and, and, and he, they laid hands on me and, and they prayed for me. And, uh, and so it was a very, very special thing to have that uh, you know, experience that I was ordained by the Holy Spirit and Chuck saw that, that, that calling in my life and Chuck affirmed that calling and Chuck commissioned me into that ministry uh, many, many years ago as a young pastor. And so I, I do believe in, in the laying on of hands. I think that it is a, a very scriptural thing for us to do even today. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, we see that in the early church, the laying on of hands was also for the distribution of spiritual gifts. 
In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12, we read this. Paul writing to the young pastor Timothy, he said, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, and do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So, Paul is referencing that Timothy, when he was a, a, a young man and he was called and commissioned into the ministry as a pastor, that the eldership, uh, the presbyteros, laid hands on him, they prayed for him, <clears throat> and they prophesied over him. And, and so this was something that was common uh, in the early church, and, and the Holy Spirit you know, worked in this way uh, then, and, and the Holy Spirit can work in, in, in that way today. The Lord could still speak prophetically uh, through his people and, and, and through um, men and women uh, who are uh, filled with the Spirit and the Lord gives utterance to speak something over someone or to exhort them or to encourage them uh, in, in their calling. He warns Timothy in 1 Timothy 5 verse 22, do not lay hands on anyone hastily nor share in other people's sins and keep yourself pure. So we have to be careful who we lay hands on to ordain into the ministry. We just ordained a whole bunch of men up here in December. We were very, very careful. We were not in a hurry to ordain the men uh, who we did ordain into ministry here at the church. We prayed, we sought counsel, we watched them for a long time, and then when we all felt confident that these are uh, the men who God is calling into these offices and positions, whether it was deacons or elders or pastors or board members, we laid hands on them, we prayed for them, and we brought them before the body and we commissioned them, we ordained them as it were, recognizing the ordination of God and, and, and praying them into uh, their, their ministries here. But it, it says, be careful, don't just lay hands on anybody uh, to... to, to uh, uh, basically commission them into a ministry if you're, if you're not sure. You have to be very, very cautious, very careful. So these are, again, back in Acts chapter 13, <clears throat> these are missionaries. They're being sent out. And, and the word apostle literally means, in the Greek, it just means someone who is sent out, the sent out ones. You have the original 11 apostles, Judas Iscariot was, was an apostle, but he uh, betrayed Jesus and he killed himself. Uh, I believe Paul was the one, not Matthias, I personally believe it was Paul who replaced um, uh, Judas Iscariot uh, because Paul's the one who went on to do such great works and write half of the uh, New Testament for us and so forth, and we never heard from Matthias again, uh, and I don't think they waited for the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit having come yet upon the early church in Acts chapter 1 when they drew lots or they drew pulled straws for the shortest straw to see which one was going to be and they picked two guys and said okay God pick one of these two but they hadn't yet received the filling of the Holy Spirit the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost yet so uh, there were 12 original apostles the 11 uh, that, that Jesus picked uh, 12 minus Judas Iscariot and then one more either Matthias or uh, Paul the apostle the other apostles were called apostles but they weren't uh, given that authority and that position of being the 12 that Jesus had handpicked. Remember, Jesus also handpicked uh, Saul when he was on the road to Tarsus. He saw the resurrected Christ and believed on him. Um, but there were many apostles that we read about in, in the Bible. An apostle just means one who is sent out by God. And so today, we still have apostles, but we don't call them apostles. We call them missionaries. And they are those who were sent out. That's literally what an apostle means. One who is sent out for the gospel and sent out for the work of the ministry. So these are uh, apostles who are doing the work of the ministry. They're being sent out <clears throat> uh, to, to, to go and to preach Christ and to preach the gospel. Verse 4 of Acts 13, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, so they were sent out by the, the church leaders, but ultimately it was the Holy Spirit who's in charge. God is, is sovereign over the affairs of his church. Being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to 
Cyprus. It is helpful if you have a Bible map. Many of you have a Bible. If you go to the end of your Bible, you could look at the Bible map and you could see Paul's missionary journeys, his first, second, third missionary journeys, and then his imprisonment. And it will show you where all these little cities are. Most of them are in the area of modern-day Turkey, modern-day Syria, even into, of course, uh, southern Italy. But a lot of, of, of where Paul would minister would be in the area of modern-day Turkey. As a matter of fact, uh, Turkey, the city of Constantinople, became uh, the primary city uh, that the church was based in up until the Roman Catholic Church established itself uh, as being the predominant church in Europe, and, and, and Rome became the headquarters uh, of the church. You had the Eastern Church that was based in the Greek Orthodox Church, which was based in Constantinople, which is in Turkey. Now it's called Istanbul. Uh, and then you had much later, centuries later, about the 6th century, 7th century A.D., uh, the Romans had established themselves as the Western Church. So you had an Eastern Church in, in, uh, in Turkey, you had a Western Church in Europe, in Southern Europe, and that became the Roman Catholic Church. And so this is where uh, these areas are. Cilicia is right there on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, um, about 16 miles east of the city of Antioch in Syria. They got into a boat, they went to an island. The island is Cyprus. Cyprus is one of the Greek islands in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, this, of course, uh, would make logical sense for them to go here because this is Barnabas' hometown. This is where Barnabas is from. And uh, also, there was a large uh, Jewish population here uh, in Cyprus. Verse 5, when they arrived in Salamis, and Salamis uh, was the largest city in the eastern half of the island of Cyprus, and there was also, historians tell us, a large number of Jews there, a large Jewish population uh, in the city of Salamis with synagogues and so forth. They preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. So this John is the same John Mark as uh, chapter 12, verse 25, when it says John, whose surname was Mark. So his name was John, but they called him Mark, again, as, as oftentimes uh, God would, would, would change their names and give them a new name. John Mark was the assistant. He was the young man who was there just helping them carry their luggage and helping them to, you know, uh, uh, take care of the surroundings and, and the lodgings and, and, and so forth. He was just there to be uh, a servant or a helper for uh, his cousin Barnabas and for Paul the Apostle there on the Isle of uh, Cyprus. Verse 6, now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name was translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So it's interesting. They go here to the island of the Greeks. They, uh, as was their custom, they would first go to the synagogue on Shabbat or on Sabbath, and they would preach there in the synagogues. We're going to see that over and over again as the pattern uh, with Paul the Apostle, especially because he, he, he knew the law so well, and he knew how to uh, take the law and to show Christ out of the Old Testament uh, to the Jews. Uh, but you had this sorcerer who was actually a Jew, but he was, uh, he was a, a false prophet. He was a magician. He was, he was somebody practicing witchcraft, actually, and uh, kind of like one of the magi or one of the, the wise men in, a, in the sense of, you know, an astrologer or a, or, or a magi or, or a sorcerer, somebody who uh, someone in government would want to have to give them advice or to give them counsel, uh, and which is very common in the ancient world. You had the uh, Oracle of Delphi. The Greeks had the Oracle of Delphi that the, the Greek kings would go to to try and get wisdom as to which battle to fight or what have you. So this is very common in the Greek wor world, very common in the Roman world. What's interesting is this man was not a, a Gentile uh, magician or sorcerer. He was, he was a Jewish man, and he had the name of Bar-Jesus, which is, you know, Bar-Yeshua, uh, son of 
Yeshua. Yeshua is the, uh, the name Joshua. Of course, Jesus was Yeshua, and, and Jesus came uh, and performed the ministry that his name said he would perform, that he is the salvation of Jehovah. That's Yah is Jehovah, and Shua is salvation. So Jesus is the salvation of Jehovah. But they would have to identify which Jesus they were speaking of when they would talk about Jesus of Nazareth. They would say, because there was a lot of uh, young Jewish kids and parents that would name their child Joshua in Bible time. So Jesus was not the only one named Jesus uh, at, at the time uh, of the early church. And Joshua, of course, was uh, a great leader, uh, Moses' right-hand man, the one who took the children of Israel across the Jordan River to conquer uh, the Promised Land. And so a lot of Jews, Jewish families would name their children Joshua or Yeshua uh, after uh, that, that patriarch, uh, that great uh, man of God in their history. But this man's name was uh, Bar uh, Yeshua or, or, or Bar Joshua, son of Joshua, but he was, he was a false prophet. He was not the real deal. He was there uh, serving this uh, proconsul, and the proconsul would be a governor who was appointed by uh, the Roman Senate. So this, this would be a leader. This would be someone who would have a lot of authority uh, from the Roman Senate to rule over an area, this proconsul, uh, that Paul and Barnabas are, are, are witnessing to and they're ministering to, and he's an intelligent man. He's interested in hearing what they have to say, but then this, this uh, Jewish false prophet is trying to oppose, of course, and trying to stop uh, the, the mission and to, and, and to shut down uh, uh, the evangelism and, and, the, and the, the mission that uh, Paul and Barnabas were uh, actively involved in here. He wanted to hear the word of God, but this sorcerer uh, withstood them. He opposed them, and he was seeking to get in the, in the ear uh, of, of the proconsul to turn him away from the faith. It's much like uh, Simon uh, in Acts chapter 8, who was also a sorcerer, Simon the sorcerer. Uh, God just doesn't have a lot of good things to say about people who practice sorcery and magic. And, you know, every time we come across this, I have to share scriptures with you because I'm just absolutely appalled by how commonplace astrology has become uh, in our culture. Everybody wants to know their sign, everybody wants to know your sign, and everybody wants to know what your horoscope says. And that is often uh, a leading way that the enemy gets people hooked into astrology and then into witchcraft. It's like the first stages of witchcraft. Or calling a psychic hotline, or talking to a psychic, or having your palm read, or going to uh, you know a crystal ball and having them read your future on a crystal ball, or or, or whatever, or or going to a séance and calling up the dead. This has become very popular. It's be ver become very commonplace, and the Bible says nothing good about sorcery or about witchcraft. As a matter of fact, there are very very severe warnings against the practice of sorcery and witchcraft. Uh, Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 9, God says, When you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. That was offering your children as a human sacrifice. I would say today that would be the equivalent of uh, aborting your, your baby, passing through the fire, murdering your baby. Or one who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, think of Harry Potter and the popularity of Harry Potter and all these Disney movies with all this sorcery that these kids are being indoctrinated into as normal, and, and even it's interesting, it's exciting, there's power with these witches and so forth. Or one who conjures a spell, they have spell books, I mean even to this day, people who practice sorcery and witchcraft or Satanism, they have spell books, they put spells and curses out there. Uh, a medium, a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead, a necromancer, someone who actually tries to communicate with the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, verse 12 of Deuteronomy 18. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God for these nations which you will dispossess. Listen to the soothsayers and the diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. So God never changed his mind about this uh, because sorcery and witchcraft is demonic at its very core. They are trying to influence the spiritual realm through their magic, through their witchcraft, through their sorcery, through their spells and their concoctions. 
uh, and, and, and so forth. And, and God has not changed his mind about that. In uh, the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 5, we are warned in the New Testament against the practice, uh, practice of sorcery. Galatians 5 and verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So as a Christian, you cannot practice these works of the flesh and think that you're saved. You just can't. The Bible says you can't. It's not me telling you you can't practice these things. God is saying, if you want to tempt God and test God and think you could live a lifestyle of practicing sorcery or practicing witchcraft and somehow still be a Christian, um, I'm, I'm afraid it's not going to go well for you when you meet God on Judgment Day because the Word of God tells us very plainly in very plain language you cannot practice witchcraft or sorcery and go to heaven. Those who practice these things are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. God couldn't be more serious uh, in, in his prohibition of the practice of sorcery and witchcraft. And again, I think we have to put that out there because a lot of people think, oh, it's just harmless. It's just astrology. It's just the horoscope. It's just your, you know, your, your sign. What sign are you? And, you know, and, and, or it's just a little spell or, you know, it, it's just this or it's just that. And it, it's all leading into uh, opening the doors to the demonic realm and the demonic world. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 6, we're told, even as we see here, that this uh, th this one who was there trying to oppose the work of, of Paul and Barnabas, uh, that, that, that the devil does uh, try and oppose the work of God. And, and the devil opposes uh, the gospel. And we have to understand that. And we have to understand that it's not the, the individual necessarily who is the witch or, 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 or the sorcerer or the Satanist even who is really your enemy. It is the devil who is, who is empowering that individual. Because we battle not against flesh and blood. Again, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, we're told, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we have to understand, even those who are practicing witchcraft, who are opposing us, and who are putting curses on us or spells against us or whatever, they're not the enemy. They are held captive by the enemy, actually. Uh, and they could be set free and they could be saved. And we need to put on uh, the full armor of God and we need to uh, pray and we need to recognize we're not wrestling against human beings or flesh and blood, but we're wrestling against powers and principalities and spiritual forces in high places that are behind them, that they've opened the door to the demonic realm, Ouija boards and, and all the rest. He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. The armor of God that we have to put on every day as we go into battle, really, because we have an enemy uh, who's out to steal, kill, and destroy, and who's getting more and more and more powerful as more people are worshiping him. I mean, you have these Grammy Awards. I, I won't even watch the videos of these Grammy Awards. I already know they're all Satanists. Jay-Z and Beyonce and all these people. I already know they're all Satanists. They don't hide it anymore. Um, but it's just so blatantly obvious. I don't know how any Christian could sit and watch these Grammys while they're doing all these things uh, for Satan so publicly. And, and you know, all the media uh, on Monday night, when we had one of the worst earthquakes in a hundred years that just took place hours earlier, earlier, all the media in America is focused on the Grammys and on these wicked, perverted Satanists with all of their satanic music and everything that they're pushing upon us instead of uh, focusing on the people who need the help in Syria and in Turkey where they're literally trying 
trying to dig out their loved ones from under the, ru- the uh, rubble. No, we'd rather watch the Satanists and, and you know, uh, uh, be entertained by their, uh, by their, by their satanic, uh, wicked uh, uh, influence and in, in, in music in America. It's just, again, uh, if God allowed an earthquake of 7.8 and then a second one of 7.5 or 7.7 to hit Turkey and Syria, imagine what God has prepared for, for California, for Los Angeles, for Hollywood. Uh, for, for, for San Francisco, honestly, think about it. It's just a matter of time. So he continues, but Elamis the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, uh, Acts 13, 8, withstood them, he opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, so from this point on Saul's name is changed to Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time and immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Verse 12, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. This is the first miracle of many miracles that are recorded uh, from Paul the Apostle. And uh, this is where Paul's, uh, Saul's name is changed to Paul. It's interesting. Uh, the name Saul uh, means prayed for, and it comes from the name in the Hebrew for King Saul. When they, the people prayed for a king and God gave them a king, King Saul, he was uh, tall, dark, and handsome. He ended up being uh, a big mistake for the nation of Israel, actually. Um, but prayed for is what Saul means. Paul is from the Latin word uh, meaning small. And so he goes from being great like a king, Saul, to taking on this humble name uh, of Paul, which means little in, in, in Latin or, or small. Um, and uh, there, there's a lot there. Some believe that he actually was a small man, and that's why he picked up that name, because he was short of stature. And there's uh, certainly a possibility that that, that, that is true. But he rebukes this, this, this uh, uh, false prophet, this, this sorcerer. Uh, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He calls out the demon, uh, calls him a son of the devil. And he, and he puts this, this uh, judgment upon him, this blindness upon him, that he would not be able to see the sun for a time. And immediately uh, the man lost his, his sight and had to be led around. He certainly didn't have any more power anymore to influence anybody. He couldn't even get himself around anymore for a time. Uh, and so uh, greater is he, 1 John chapter 4 uh, tells us, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Again, 1 John 4, 4, you were of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you uh, than, than he that is in the world. And so we have the Holy Spirit of God. You and I are not more powerful than the demons of the devil, but the Holy Spirit is more powerful. Jesus Christ is the name of which uh, every knee will bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And every time will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been granted unto me. And then Jesus gave the authority to the church. So it's not that we have the authority over the devil. It's that the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, uh, the Spirit of Christ who resides in us, uh, has all power over the devil and over the demonic realm. And so we don't have to fear the enemy, uh, but we have to be aware that the enemy is out there and, and he's seeking uh, uh, whom he may destroy. He's, he's seeking to still kill and destroy. He's a murderer and a liar, Jesus said from the beginning. He's very active in our world. The spirit of Antichrist was already at work, John said in 1 John chapter 2. Thousands of years ago, John said the spirit of Antichrist is already at work in the world. How much more now, 2,000 years later, is the spirit of Antichrist at work uh, in our generation as the world is getting ready to receive the Antichrist as their, uh, as their leader and to follow him and take his mark and all the rest. So that's where we're going to stop here. I knew I wasn't going to get very far with this tonight. I didn't want to rush through this, and we will um, continue and pick up in verse 13 of Acts chapter 13 uh, next Wednesday night. Let's pray. And Jesus, we thank you that your name is above every name, Lord. We thank you that you call us your people, that we are called Christians, Christ ones. We thank you, Lord God, that you have given us your Holy Spirit, your precious Holy Spirit, Lord God, who is greater 
than, uh, than the Antichrist, who's greater than the devil in the demonic realm, the whole host of the demonic realm. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. And, and we thank you, Lord, that you are still working through your church, Lord. You are still saving people. People are still being set free uh, from the enemy, the lies of the enemy and the bondage of sin, Lord God. We thank you that you're doing a work in our lives. You're doing a work in our church in this generation, Lord. And we pray, Father God, that even as we saw that Paul the Apostle was filled with the Holy Spirit, Lord God, and was not afraid to take on anyone, Lord, that you would fill us in that way with your spirit. Forgive us for our sins, Lord. Uh, help us to uh, mortify and crucify and deny our flesh, Lord God. Help us to uh, run to you, Lord God, and to stick close to you, Lord, and stay in your word, Father, to be men and women of prayer. And Father, that you would use us in these last days uh, in a mighty way. Bless us, watch over us, go with us now, protect us, watch over our loved ones, and bring us back again next time safely, we pray. And it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen.